it's going fine, Joe. How's it going with you? Doing all right. Joe, I really like this film. I didn't know what to expect, especially because about the only thing we've ever really seen on the big or small screen about Maine or any part of it is Jessica Fletcher in Cabot Cove on Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> so seeing Maine, seeing Portland, seeing the seacoast, seeing the lobstering uh, to this, with this intensity and degree is wonderful. It's a whole new, uh, it's a whole new world, really. And you bring in that crime factor, the, you know, the crime boss idea, which we've seen in Philly and South Jersey and Chicago and New York. But you don't really expect or think about it somewhere like Maine. And I really like that. And I love how you develop this story and this script with your pacing, with the characters, but most of all, with the moral ambiguity. There is no black and white in this film, but for possibly Emma, and even that's a little, a little questionable at times, but you really bring out those multi-shades of gray of life and of the darker side of life while still giving us some rays of hope and positivity, and I love how you structured that. Oh, thank you so much. I, I love to hear you say that. It really, really means a lot to us. Um, and with with it being set in Portland, uh, that all started with Greg. Greg is from there, born and raised there. Um, and I was working for APS Films, which was led by Edwin Stevens, uh, who's also from Maine. Um, and those two guys, they really have such a passion uh, for the location. They know. So much more about the location that it'll take me another lifetime to understand. Uh, but we had the same creative DNA, and we, uh, you know, we really leaned on each other to, to develop the story. And Greg had been living with this idea for so many years, um, and I think he, he may have chimed in. Correct. I'm here. I'm just listening. Oh, what's up, Greg? Uh, Greg's Greg's being sneaky. He he's being <laughs> very very sneaky. I'm a listener. <laughs> Yeah, a, a little lurky lube in the background here. Hi, Greg. How are you? I'm fine. I'm so happy you're here. Happy you're having us. Oh, I'm thrilled. So, Joe, continue. Continue as the lurky Lou is listening. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just think, you know, I was, um, you know, I was honored that, that Greg trusted me with this uh, story that he's been very passionate to tell for so many years. Um, and I visited Maine a couple of years prior uh, with Ed Stevens. Uh, we were working on a documentary, and then we did another feature film there. Uh, and I fell in love with the area. You know, I, coming from Philadelphia, there's a, there's a lot of similarities. You know, there's mm -hmm. smaller, blue-collar towns, but obviously Portland, Maine is a port city that has this, you know, the focus on the, the lobster. And um, so you basically replace cheesesteaks with, with lobster rolls, That's in my opinion. <laughs> That's pr that's pretty much uh, it. But no, it goes it goes beyond that. Uh, Portland is a, is a, another league of its own. It's one of my favorite cities, uh, and the, the community there, and the help that we got when we were shooting there, and the way they embraced us uh, and supported Greg and Ed and myself uh, was it was absolutely wonderful. It was amazing. You know, Greg. You know what prompted you to come up with this story? You were you were acting. Um, by the way, I loved you in the estate. Um, that I oh, saw, saw I saw the estate. Oh, with a poster like that, it was impossible not to tell the publicist, yes, I want to see this. And I got a kick out of it. I got a yeah, kick that, out. That was a fun ride. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, so what prompted you to decide you wanted to tell a story, obviously close to your heart because it's your hometown? Um, you know, and yeah. what led you to awesome. this story? You could have gone, you know, very upbeat, very happy, but you chose this grittier, this grittier story. And as I said to Joe, it's filled with these, you know, a multiplicity of shades of gray and moral ambiguities. So it's an interesting take to tell. Um, so I'm curious of your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, growing up, first and 
foremost growing up as a, as a, a movie fan, and, you know, uh, I, I'm your typical, like, I just love those, you know, when, when Joe says we have the same creative DNA, I think Joe and I bond over The Sopranos more than anything. Um, <laughs> we just love that genre, first and foremost. And, you know, I w- it was 2005. I was in Los Angeles. I was struggling and working, you know, odd-end jobs, and, and I was the auditions I was going out for weren't, you know, really exciting to me. And I just had the wild idea to come up with something. And in a, in a complete dream world, I would, I, would, I would shoot it in Maine. And that was, like, always my goal. And, you know, Portland, as you saw in the movie, it, it, it's so beautiful and, and great and charming, but it also is a very gritty-looking uh, city. And I knew that a gritty crime drama with, you know, a love story as well, it would just fit so well there. And, um, you know, that was kind of how it, it sprung. Yeah, oh, forget about the love story. Go with the gritty, gritty crime drama every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> every, every time you want that. Just a, just a little bit of love in there to, to you know, yeah. tease some people. Yeah, for the wives that are sitting there with the husbands watching the crime unfold. But <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> But, you know, and you, you, t- you both talk about the beauty of, of Portland, and seeing it on screen, it truly does look beautiful. The architecture is old. It's old world. It's fabulous. I love, I love the architecture of the East Coast um, because it just screams. It's beautiful, but that's credit to uh, Ed, to be honest with you. I get it. Joe, but, you know, Ed, Ed obviously. Yeah, Ed, was the Ed is a supremely talented. Ed is a supremely talented cinematographer, and then when you put him in a place like Maine, uh, it's a match made in heaven. Oh, yeah. they're all. And I knew that. I knew. I knew. Watching a couple of Ed's, uh, pro- and Joe's prior uh, projects, I knew. I just knew. I knew it was uh, Portland and, and Ed and Joe were a match made in heaven. Well, you know, I'm curious for you, Joe. How did you and Ed go about finding the visual tonal bandwidth? Because I love. I love the visual, the overall visual tonal bandwidth, and the nuance that comes into play. You never take anything really dark. You visually capture shades of gray within the gray of the sea, the gray of the sky, and you punctuate that with, you know, darkening up perhaps the brick of the buildings. But then you give us bright spots like Tommy's home. It's white on white, and then you surround everything with snow, which is a cinematographer's nightmare. And you take us all the way to we get sun and light and hope. So you've got a beautiful t- visual tonal design here. So I'm curious as to your thoughts working with Ed and what, how the two of you developed this look. Yeah, I think the... the great thing about working with Ed is he's, he's a cinematographer that can make anything look pretty, but he's story-driven. And we knew this was a story, like you said, that was filled with moral ambiguity that, was, that existed in this gray area. Uh, and we knew a big part of this film, uh, a lot of what this film hinges on, is that contrast between these summer memories mm-hmm. that Tommy has with Emma and this, this hope that he's clinging on to um, with the, the harsh reality that he's living in now. So we always leaned into that, uh, and we always put an emphasis on that. And when we, you know, we're in Portland thinking about where we are in the story and the scene, and it's just always, always conscious of, you know, why we're, we're telling this scene or why this shot exists, and, and Ed always has a finger on the pulse of the story. And as a cinematographer, that's not always guaranteed. So um, very, very lucky to be working with a, a cast and crew that always were thinking about story first and knew exactly where we were in the story at all times to help you out tremendously. And that's something I also noticed with, you know, Ed's framing. You guys really stayed away from the extreme clo- from the extreme close-ups. And you went more for your mid-two shots and then your wide shots that really give us an idea that while, and we always have a lot of people in the frame. So you feel the close-knit community the camaraderie and even the antagonism between some people. But we see the wider scope. So it's not just pigeonholed. You take it out a little further, giving us the illusion of how it impacts elsewhere, 
which we see unfold in the story when we get, you know, the Italians involved from the north um, with what their crime boss wants. So I really love how the two of you did that visually. Um, and not too many directors and cinematographers, I think, would have gone that route. I think they would have pushed in with a lot of ECUs and really gone with that darker, gritty, negative space. Uh, so I love how you guys designed this. Yeah, we were, um, you know, we had a, a very long conversation before we started, and the film we did prior was the opposite direction. It was filled with close-ups because um, it was about the, some of the darker personal secrets that people held. So we, we had a lot of close-ups with people in shadow, and for this we wanted the environment and the surroundings mm -hmm. uh, to play a huge role in every shot, like you said. Um, and I was one of, you know, I was like, yeah, I'd really like to open it up for this film and kind of avoid close-ups. And we take our close-ups very sparingly. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's, I'm glad that you found it effective and that you felt that watching the film. It's, it's really, really uh, is validating for us. Yeah, I really like that you did that. Because, as I said, most directors and cinematographers would have gone the opposite direction and really pushed in to get the lines on faces and the intensity um, but no, you're expanding and you're metaphorically showing us that what's going on is bigger than just a couple of people, that it, it affects everything. Yeah. And I love that. You know, how challenging was it for you, Greg, stepping into the role of Tommy? Because you're walk Tommy's walking such a fine line here, especially anytime he's around Emma. Um, and then the intensity the confrontations between Tommy and Kerrigan, and I have to say, incredible casting with Judson Mills as, as Pete Kerrigan. Absolutely love him in that role. But I'm curious as to how you went about developing your performance of Tommy, given that tightrope that you've got to walk. Yeah, um, I feel like Tommy, it had to be a lot of containment because there's two things. Tommy after we'll call it the incident with um with mikey you know pre, pre that you know tommy and i don't know how much you know we showed about that but you know during the flashback scene there was a little more pep, pep in his step and uh he had a little more to live for and a little more hope and uh, you know post incident you know under the thumb of, of kerrigan in this town he's kind of um kind of beaten down like a like a beaten puppy. He was uh, this tough guy and, and and confident and now he's just been beaten down for seven years and and then the stuff with um, Emma is he's, he, speaking of secrets, he's holding a secret. And again, containment he can't open up as much as he wants to as much as he wants to. So it's it was a lot of that. It was a lot of uh, just kind of getting in that space where it was you know, I'm, I'm beaten down, and, you know, the cold winter in Maine helped me uh, with that, and, and that's just something I held on to. Yeah, speaking of that cold winter in Maine, how much fun was that for both of you guys, um, blocking, shooting, moving around town, and freezing yourselves to death, and being out on the water? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think I it, it definitely added an element to the film that you wouldn't have been able to, to replicate without that cold, harsh winter, for sure. I did. Yeah, I, it, it's, uh, I'm just very happy everybody was game and on board. I think we had, like, I think I gave that slight speech, like, hey, it's going to be freezing, everyone. <laughs> just get ready, and however you think, however cold you think it's going to be, it's going to be colder, and everyone was game and no complaints, but... Yeah, I mean, it was rough. There's no, there's no doubt about it. How did the weather hold we up for you, lucky. Joe? We had a very amazing cast and crew. I can't say that enough. It was just the perfect yeah. blend of personalities and people there. That everybody, we had a really, really good time, despite the conditions. And yeah. again, the uh, the community of Portland really, really helped. If they weren't so welcoming, and um, it, you know, it would have been a lot tougher. But but they they really allowed us to get this done. You know, and you meant you both mentioned the community of Portland, and this is really reflected with the individual characters that you have here. A perfect example is Marty. Kirk Fox does a great job as Marty, 
And, you know, he's always observational. He runs his mouth in the bar. But, boy, oh, boy, when Tommy needs something, Marty's there at the drop of a hat. Or the drop of a phone on the bar, as quick as he can get to, to do what, what, what he needs. But you never really get the sense that they're besties or anything like that. But, and then you've got, you know, George just running off to do something. Um, even Uncle Billy, he steps up. You've got other people that, that step in. And I find that that speaks to what you're saying about the people of Portland. Because it's like, you may not know everybody, you may not be best friends, you may not be that involved, but when somebody needs something, they come. They come. 100%. I remember we were location scouting, and we had a list of places that we needed to find. And, uh, Kevin Haley, who's a local there, part of the police force, he just took us around. We thought we were going to see two or three places that day. I think we saw a dozen. Calling people up on the phone, we need this, we need that, can you get me this? Can you get us that? Uh, and then Greg's brother, Zach, also a huge help in, in getting everything together. And then, you know, Greg, Greg's friends and family, who's got a house, who's got this, who's got that. Uh, it was so much easier uh, than I thought it would be because uh, it's a very ambitious project for, you know, for the, the level we were doing it at. And, again, wouldn't have been able to happen without all those people. Yeah, and I, I just love that that comes across with your characters on screen. And that speaks volumes about Portland. And that's really one of the bright lights that counters the grays of the story. Uh, yeah, I think um, Christy, Christy Faison and Jamie Rudofsky, our casting directors, really brought in amazing talent for us. They, they were essential in, in us getting the film that we, that we got. Uh, and all the actors, you know, from Greg, obviously, developing the story and, and creating the story, but... Uh, even people like Kirk Fox and uh, uh, Dennis Cockrum, uh, they elevated the script on another level. Kirk really looked at Marty, and he was like, okay, he's comic relief, but he is also a support system for, for Tommy, and really highlighted that and did more with the material than I could have ever dreamed of. So, And that started with the casting directors and then um, manifested itself with the actors on set. It was, it was phenomenal. You know, how difficult... Blessed. Really or blessed. How difficult or challenging was the casting? Because this is, it, it's a, a semi-large ensemble, and while most people are supporting players, it's like you lose one of them. It's like Joss Glenny Smith as Brennan. You know, he stand out. He is malevolence. He is, he's great. But, you know, you take him away and everything, him specifically in that role... And I don't think it would ever be the same. So I'm curious how difficult the casting was to get this recipe right. That's uh, uh, honestly, uh, it, it, it didn't feel that difficult, uh, to be honest. You know, but again, it was it was me, it was Greg, it was Ed, it was our other producer Corey, um, and it was our casting directors. You know, that all had eyes on it. So for me, I, I watched certain tapes and I like certain tapes but I remember Greg seeing Joss and Greg is like oh no that's you know that's Brennan look at his face we got to bring him back that's him right and then there's you know there's other standouts for other people and with everybody working together we, I think we put together a really really good cast and it, it felt really really lucky no you Greg, kind of cut you off there no no I was going to echo that and, and again you know shout out to our cast because it it, it it was a dream casting session, and when you say was it how difficult was it? It wasn't. We just watched, and we honestly, at least I know Joe. I can speak for Joe. We couldn't believe how dead on all of our choices were, and it was almost very quickly unanimous. And this, the people just came ready, and they were so damn talented. We got lucky. You know, Greg, you're also a producer on the film. Were you? How involved were you from a producing standpoint? Or did you let yourself just focus on your performance once the camera yeah, started I, I, rolling? I, I mean, I think like Joe and Ed trusted trusted me. I trusted them. And I mean, as far as, yeah, I mean, for, like, you know, I, I kind of, that was part of the thing. I told Joe and Ed in the beginning, like, you know, Portland, they're going to they're gonna have our backs. And, you know, I have connections there to, to ease the... Uh, the pain of making a movie and, you know, between my brother and uh, Zach and, you know, Kevin, Haley, I mean, it was, uh, you know, we shot in my basement. We shot at my dad's office. 
that we, you know, shot, you know, I just, at the, the next to the pizzeria I used to work at. I mean, it, I, I was involved in that sense, but, um, yeah, it was, I think it was kind of hard not to get my hands on it in, in, <laughs> in a production standpoint because it was just, it was very close to home, part of the fun. So, but we all trusted each other. It was definitely a, uh, it was a group effort for sure. You know, this film is, a film like this, it's always about, your editing is so key in establishing the pacing, giving us that, that pot boiler burn, you know, slow burn leading up to that third act. Um, Joe, how, how lengthy was your editing process? I know you'd work with Meredith before, um, so obviously I'm thinking you guys have a, perhaps a shorthand with your editing, but I'm curious how long the editing process was and finding that balance and that beat, that heartbeat of this story. Yeah, I think uh, Meredith, amazing editor, she offers a, always offers a perspective that, that we don't have for the most part, which helps tremendously in creating a, a film that's multifaceted and, um, you know, again, existing in that gray area. The actual process of the edit took a little bit. Um, I don't remember how long exactly, but I know that we were doing it during COVID. Mm -hmm. We were lucky to finish the film right before COVID hit, so we had to do a lot of it virtually. And because I've collaborated with Meredith before, um, and Luke, our sound mixer, sound designer, and Aaron, our composer, uh, I think we had a, you know, a workflow and a partnership, and um, there was a trust that was already built there. Without that, I think it would have been a lot more difficult to do this virtually and not being in the same room for most of the time. But, you know, again, I think a film is made three times. Right? It's made when it's shot. It's made when it's... It's made when it's written, it's made when it's shot, and it's made when it's edited. Um, and you kind of have to be unbiased at every point. And Meredith, having her in the edit, editor's chair is just, it's, it's like having an ace up your sleeve. You know, she, she brings a lot uh, to the table that you can never dream of and never think of. And, you know, we, there was a lot of, you know, cutting on the editing room floor that were really good scenes that we really liked, but we always kept the story in mind and what was best for the story and, keeping that pacing in mind, like you said, that I think turned out really well. Uh, she, was, she was crucial. Yeah, that pacing. We get to that hour three, uh, that hour three minute mark, and you just, you kick it into high gear there. Um, I mean, it yeah. just, you know, you lead up, you lead up, you know, we've got big stuff happening at 49 minutes, 58 minutes, but man, you hit that hour three minute mark, and you fly. And, you know, you can't, I didn't even want to blink because I thought I would miss something. Um, you really. I was really excited when we were building that in the edit. I was like, because you're in, you're in production and you're having a good time and everybody feels great, but you don't know what you really have until you're in post-production sitting in the room and putting everything together. And while we were doing that, I was like, oh, this is, this is special. We, ha we have something here. Mm -hmm. well, Very you, exciting. You know, you mentioned a key word. For me, and it was the first thing I noticed when I started watching the film, and that is your sound. Applause, applause, applause on your sound. We're hearing the water as the boat's going through it. We're hearing all the little, the little elements, the little clanking things, the ropes, um, the winches, all those little things on the boat. We're hearing the birds. We're hearing the wind. The sound mix is impeccable and then you bring in Aaron Bagley's score which is not what I expected but given this movie it fits perfectly and is expected once you see the film the score makes perfect sense um, it's not what you would traditionally expect with a quote-unquote crime crime kind of movie but the sound and the score and that mix is incredible um what were what were you looking for musically with aaron and you know then from a sonic standpoint with that sound mix and working with luke because the little details from the snow to poor tommy getting hit by a car um <laughs> we hear all these sounds we hear the punches you know, we hear the appropriate gunshot when guns are fired. You know, a rifle, 12-gauge shotgun sounds a lot different 
than a little handgun pistol. And we get all of that. So talk to me, Joe, about this, because the sound is the first thing that struck me, and I went, wow. Yeah, I think, you know, it really starts with Louise, which is our sound mixer in production, um, because without him getting some, you know, quality sounds in Portland, you know, it makes Luke's job, our sound mixer in post, a lot harder. And I remember a specific moment when um, we were shooting that lighthouse scene, the observatory scene, uh -huh. with Tommy and Emma up in the observatory, and you could hear the wind whistling outside. Mm -hmm. That wind you know, was really howling and whistling while we were shooting. And I remember talking to Louise, and Louise was like, it sounds great except for that wind, unless you want that. And I'm like, we totally want that. Like, that was six day four of shooting, and it, it really clicked. It's like, we really need to embrace not just the images of Portland, but the sounds that come with it as well. Um, and then Luke did an amazing job in post, replacing things, highlighting things, getting it to a certain level. And then with Aaron, I think, Again, we lean we lean into that idea of the story is how we have to balance this 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 crime, um, this grittiness, the harsh realities of the world that Tommy's living in now, with those bright memories of the past and and the hope that he still kind of clings on to and holds on to that he may have buried. Um, and I think when Aaron came out with, I, I didn't give any notes to Aaron before he gave us the first pass of the of the score, and he gave us the the song that you hear in the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. the observatory when Tommy's with Emma first and it really reminded me of like scores of Tangerine Dream uh, and then I thought about you know what what Tangerine Dream did when they did do these crime thrillers and Tangerine Dream did this amazing score for Thief Michael Mann's first feature film mm, with, uh, yes. James Caan and it was like it, that's what it really reminded me of um, and I was like I love that for Tommy and Emma's theme and then we kind of just built on it from there but it all started with that one piece which was really important for the whole film. Oh, just, I, I love, I just so love your sound mix with the score here. Um, and it's all those little details that really give us the flavor of Portland that means so much to you, Greg. I, I just love it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do too. <laughs> so now at the end of the day, everybody's going to have a chance to see this film. You know, what... I'm curious for you, Greg, what did you learn about yourself here, not only as an actor, but as a storyteller, since this story originated with you? What did you learn about yourself that you can now take forward into your future projects and hopefully into further storytelling from story idea on up? Oh, that's a great heavy question um you know i i was rolling with this thing for you know what 14 years and you know all these it was such a weird day the last day of shooting i felt so sad you know because in a way it was over and um i'm so happy with the way it came out and it sounds corny i've said it a couple times but it is you know meeting joe meeting ed Corey, you know you know, Kirk, all these people that were involved, you know, and have my, you know, family and friends involved, it, it's the people. And it's, it, that's what life's about. It's your relationships with people at the end of the day when you go. It's the effect you had on people and the effect people had on you. And just the whole movie-making experience and having it be just this team thing. And that's, that's what I take with me the most. You know, it, 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 it was the experience and the people and the relationships and and that's what it is for me. Yeah, and, and for you, Joe, you know, what did you... I mean, every film presents its own challenges, and you always learn something, but as a director, what did you learn with this film? Other than shooting in snow and cold is really damn hard and uncomfortable, um, <laughs> what did you learn that you'll take forward into your future, into future films? Yeah, this is this is kind of the. Um, I'm trying to search for the, the right word, but the. Uh, this is what I want to do over and over again. The experience I had on this film, um, because I think, you know, there's this toxic idea that floats around in Hollywood that if you're a great director, you have to be this auteur that tortures himself, and it's got to be difficult, and you really got to push people to get what you want. And, 
You know, while there's times where you get, yeah, you do have to figure out what, how we could make something work. Um, you know, I think art is super important, but at the end of the day, we're not saving the manatees. We're, we're, you know, playing dress up and make believe. And I want to do that with people I love, and I want to do it in a way that everybody feels heard and supported, and everybody can take ownership of what they bring to the table in the film because their ideas were were heard and, and were listened to. So I take Down East, um, and I I want to I want to make Down East again and again and again. Uh, and, and tell stories with, with people that I love the way we did it this time. Oh, well, I can't wait to see. I hope the two of you collaborate again, but I can't wait to see what each of you does individually. I, I, I really like this, this film. As I said, Greg, I have, you know, admired your work on screen. Um, Joe, this is my first experience seeing a film directed by you. I want to see more. I have to go back and see Dark Harbor now. Um, but... I can't wait to see what you guys do next. And, you know, maybe you'll even go, you know, I know I know you shot something in South Jersey, Joe. Maybe you go back to cheesesteak country. You just came from lobster country. Maybe you go back to cheesesteak country. <laughs> hey, if he wants to bring me, I love cheesesteak, so I can I can vibe with that. Oh, well, d there there we have it. That's the solution. Cheesesteaks and soft I'm pretzels. Sure, I'm sure I will be doing another film with Greg. And I'm sure I'll be doing another film in Philly at some point in my career. So <laughs> it's a very real possibility. <laughs> oh, uh, guys. I want to thank you for your kind words. Thank you so much. For real. Oh, my God. If the film sucked, I would tell you. I don't hold back. I would tell you. So, no. <laughs> you, Debbie. You guys did a great job. And sincerely, I can't wait to see what you, what you bring us next. I'm, I, re I really am anxious to see that. Guys, thank you so much. Thanks, Abby. I really appreciate it.